Thank you. It's uh, a pleasure to be here amongst a very distinguished uh, room of fellows and uh, wonderful speakers today. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about targeted prevention. Um, first, I'll give you a bit of an overview of the field, and um, then I'll talk about um, some mechanism-based research, uh, which has led to the development of a new approach to prevention. So let me just start by um, giving you a bit of an overview of the framework in which I work, and it's studying addiction from a developmental perspective. Um, the reason for that um, is, uh, is uh, there are many reasons, actually. Um, one is there's a recognition that most substance use disorders have their, symptom, their first symptom onset uh, during adolescence. Um, so even though it's an adult disorder, the onset of the disorder appears to be in childhood years and adolescence. Um, the earlier the onset of the first symptom, the greater the risk for future problems, and that's been document documented in a number of different epidemiologic and clinical studies. And we also know that the earlier onset, um, substance users tend to have much more severe course, a more complex course of the disorder associated with a number of health and social consequences. But there's also been this more recent um, focus on addiction from a developmental perspective with um, some of the newer findings in, in developmental neuroscience. So up until about 10, 15 years ago, uh, many people believed, um, because they were simply focusing on uh, brain uh, structure or volume or neuropsychological tasks um, and uh, general IQ tasks, that most of cognitive and neural development was complete by the end of childhood, by about 11 years of age. But what we know now through much more sophisticated neuroimaging and neuropsychological studies is that the, the adolescent period is a period of extreme neurodevelopment, and it's not so much about the brain growing, but it's about the brain um, going through changes to allow it to be a more efficient machine. So there's pruning and there's um, um, strengthenings of associations and circuits. And the very circuits that appear to be um, changing during the adolescent periods are those same circuits that we've been talking about all morning and afternoon, and that's stratofrontal um, circuits. And what we know is that young people with substance use disorders have impairments in those very circuits. So the very big question today is, is it possible that the early onset of substance use and its risk for future disorders is due to some form of neurotoxicity during the adolescent years? And that's a big question that everyone's trying to answer. So last year, there was a huge call by NIAAA in the US, a $25 million call that was a very specific call designed to um, establish this very effect. So uh, establish a longitudinal cohort that would um, uh, study the problem both in terms of onset and then the effect markers for addiction and then the effects of substance use once it had its onset. Um, so despite this um, recent recognition that um, the adolescent period is very formative in terms of development of addiction, I'll just um, uh, um, go over some um, really important um, data that are available and, and only available in Canada, thanks to Jurgen Rem and his colleagues at CAMH. So this is a, a study on the costs that uh, Canadians um, spend in a given year on, um, on substance abuse. And what you see is that we're spending about $40 billion a year on substance abuse. By the way, there was an, a report that was commissioned by the, um, the UK um, Parliament that was very similar to this and resulted in very similar statistics, but that c report was buried because the government didn't want to hear about it. And so this is the actually only publicly available estimate of substance use and related harm um, that uh, of this level of sophistication. What I want to point out is how much we spend in Canada on prevention uh, in terms of delivery of programs and on research um, for, um, for drug and alcohol prevention. And if you do the math, right here, divided by this, it's less than 1% of the overall costs of substance use to society. So um, why is that? And there's, there is a historical context to it. So I'm just going to briefly go over all the different 
kind of levels of intervention within the field of substance use to finally get to the point of targeted prevention. So first, um, in terms of acute treatments for substance use disorders, we know that they're generally everything that's available out there has some kind of moderate effect, reduces substance use by about 50% if it's delivered with fidelity. Um, but there's this recognition now of this decade of harm. So most substance users, like other psychiatric patients with other psychiatric disorders, most substance use dis uh, users experience a full decade of quite severe harm before receiving treatment. And then there are also some estimates that a very small proportion of all those who could benefit from treatment actually ever receive treatment. Um, that stimulated a whole new area of research and, and treatment delivery, which is brief indicated interventions, so for not waiting for people to present for treatment, for acute treatment, or to develop severe forms of the disorder, but to deliver brief indicated interventions for those who are experiencing early signs of problems. And again, these interventions, oops, sorry, these interventions are producing about 50, or moderate effect sizes, about 50% reduction in substance-related behaviors generally. Um, but there's also the recognition that this is a time-limited effect. And if you think, it's interesting, if you think about all the stuff we heard um, about earlier today, about sensitization, about long-term changes to possibly even to DNA, um, it kind of makes sense that interventions um, that are delivered slightly late in the course of this of the disorder will will only have effects as they're being implemented or delivered, but they can't ever cure the problem. And so um, there's um, obviously a need to perhaps prevent people from ever taking up the substance, which is um, a big part of prevention efforts. Um, some studies have suggested that. Um, about 80% of young people in North America are exposed to some form of universal prevention, drug and alcohol prevention program. These programs generally look like um, drug education and programs that are designed to help young people just say no or, or be, be better at saying no to when they're being offered substances. Um, there's a huge literature and there are a number of Cochrane reviews and meta-analyses that have demonstrated now that the majority of what's being delivered it to young people in schools around drug and alcohol prevention is either not evaluated or ineffective. Only two programs have been shown to have even remotely promising effects on drug and alcohol prevention, the Life Skills Training Program and the Strengthening Families Program. And these programs are identified as being comprehensive in that they go beyond just helping young people say no or helping young people understand the harms associated with substance use. They're training them on general life skills or their improving the um, home environment through uh, improving parenting skills. But even so, these studies are suggesting that um, implementation is difficult. Effects are very small, so they tend to be about 10% reductions at the population level. Um, and so I've got a big red arrow at this other category, selective intervention. So considering how much we know about addiction, why don't we, uh, why don't we have more interventions that are targeting those very risk factors or populations who we know are at higher risk for addictive uh, behaviors? And I'll tell you, um, just from epidemiologic data, um, this, is, this is just a sample study. It's a study that was published in the 90s, I think, by Bridget Grant, a very, very prolific uh, epidemiologist. But essentially, I, I like this slide because it shows you all the, the generic risk factors for addiction, um, demographic as well as individual risk factors. And it kind of lines them up against each other. So here you have that age of onset effect where it's estimated that for every year substance use is, is earlier, you're increasing your risk for future alcohol dependence or abuse by 10%. So there's estimates that if you could delay onset by a year, you could reduce substance use rates in the adult population by a good 10%. Uh, male gender, being Caucasian, being unmarried, being younger, dropping out of school. But look at these effects. So these are odds ratios. So it's like an odds ratio of three would, would say that you're three times at greater risk for developing the problem. And so what my point here is that what we've known for a long time is young people who are demonstrating um, personality and behavioral risk profiles, even before the onset of substance use, are accounting for a lot of the future risk. And why have we not developed intervention programs that target these young people? 
Uh, so that's exactly what the work I do um, is focused on. It's understanding how personality behavioral risk profiles, such as disinhibition, you heard about that this morning, how is it that these are related to um, substance use in adolescents? We know that the personality risk factors for future alcohol and drug dependence are, are the same risk factors that predict um, risk for other mental disorders. And we also know that the genetic predisposition to alcoholism is mediated through personality. And this has been demonstrated through molecular genetic studies, family high-risk studies, as well as behavioral genetic studies or twin studies. So what is being inherited is disinhibited personality and some other personality traits. It's not just one personality risk profile. It's actually quite a few. And these traits um, can be identified as impulsivity or disinhibition that could be categorized or having two subcomponents, impulsivity and sensation seeking or thrill seeking. But that what's, what's really fascinating about this area is that there are also a number of traits that look very different from disinhibition that are also implicated in risk for substance misuse, and those are associated with risk for mood disorders or for anxiety disorders. Um, and this is just a diagram that my, my students and I use um, to, to just um, summarize the literature on personality risk factors, their involvement in substance-related behavior, other comorbid disorders, but also the motivational and cognitive processes that, um, that appear to mediate that risk. Let me give you an example of, um, of um, one study that, um, that shows how we've come to understand these risk profiles. So as many people in, in this room probably agree, there's very little validity to the distinction between antisocial behaviors and substance use disorders in that most people who have an antisocial personality profile also have a substance use disorder, um, to the extent that some people would argue that it, there's really only one disorder, and that is the, an externalizing behavior disorder of which substance use and antisocial behaviors are just symptoms. And there's uh, quite a bit of research now using large twin and epidemiologic studies looking at the structure of the variance in clinical symptoms, suggesting that, in fact, the, the way to understand these highly comorbid behaviors is that, indeed, there is this one general common latent factor that accounts for the overlap between all of these disinhibited behaviors, but that there's also some unique variance to conduct disorder, and there's unique variance to substance misuse, and most of that unique variance is specific to drinking behavior. Um, and why is this important or helpful? Well, we're starting to begin to now understand these latent constructs um, and what um, and how it is that different personality factors are implicated in, um, in these behaviors when they co-occur and also when they exist in isolation. And here what you see is that you have two different personality traits, impulsivity being implicated in that general tendency towards addictive behaviors, but thrill-seeking, sensation-seeking, uh, so it's non-impulsive sensation-seeking, is quite specifically related to substance misuse and, and really quite focused on heavy drinking. And this is a longitudinal study where we assessed, using a self-report measure, we assessed impulsivity in 14-year-olds we followed them up over a two-year period on their conduct symptoms, and indeed, um, impulsivity at 14 years of age predicts your likelihood of developing conduct problems um, to a degree of like you're at six-fold increased risk of having significant conduct problems if you score one standard deviation above the mean on impulsivity at 14. And what appears to, using some cognitive experimental type designs, what we've shown is that um, a very simple neuropsychological task that measures response inhibition. And what response inhibition is, is generally it's a, it's a cognitive measure of your ability to stop, your ability to put stop on your behavior. So this task essentially involves someone being trained to press a button every time they see a letter on the screen. So if a Y appears on the screen, you're to, you're to press a button. And the simple objective of the task is if, a, if an, another letter comes up on the screen, you're not to respond. So it's a test of stopping behavior. And what we showed is that 
this longitudinal relationship here is mediated, it's accounted for by how you do on this task, how well you stop, how, how well um, controlled your stopping behavior is. Um, with respect to sensation seeking, we have very different effects. Um, sensation seekers tend to be more intelligent, they tend to be more gregarious, they have very good response inhibition, they're good at stopping, uh, they do well on most neuropsychological tasks, have high working memory, but in conditions where there's reward, so if you start to reward them for their stopping behavior, they become, they become more impulsive. So we've come to understand this profile is looking very different from a general disinhibition profile where someone is really only impulsive under rewarding situations. And clinically what these people look like are they, they tend to be quite successful in life, but under certain conditions, the music is right, the friends are right, alcohol is present, one drink becomes 10 drinks. And that's the kind of um, scenarios that are described. So. How much time do I have left? Three minutes. Oh boy. Um, I'm not going to. Um, I'm not going to tell you too much more about the mechanism-based work. Um, um, and instead, what I'd like to do is quickly talk about an intervention program that we've developed that essentially targets these different personality traits. I haven't had time to talk about the internalizing dimensions, but just to give you an example of how this mechanism-based work is now informing the development of personality-targeted inter interventions. So this would be a two-session group intervention where there's some motivational interviewing component, but then there's also a very strong cognitive behavioral component where we're helping young people better manage their inability to stop. So it's cognitive behavioral strategies targeted, poor response inhibition, <coughs> or targeting your reward sensitivity. And these are manual-based programs that are delivered in schools by very well-trained psycho psychologists um, initially. Um, and children are sent home booklets that they can work on, but they also work on these as, as a group in, their, in, the, in the classroom. Um, and we've done a number of proof of concept studies, efficacy studies, effectiveness studies. We're at phase four, and if you believe in phase five, we're there too. So there are some studies happening in Australia and the Netherlands um, with First Nations communities in Canada. Um, <clears throat> but I, I'll just give you some results from the, the, um, one of the, effect, the efficacy studies. And this is just looking at long-term outcomes, two-year outcomes of um, drinking-related problems in those who received a personality-matched intervention versus a control, inter uh, control condition, which was no intervention. And what you see is two-year reductions in the number of drinking problems that these people, that, um, that youth report. And um, the way in which this appears to manifest itself is through delaying the onset of their drinking. And so um, in a second study, um, uh, this is an effectiveness study. We were interested in developing the program so that it could be more realistically and more easily disseminated to the community. And so we um, um, developed a training program that trained schools to develop this, to implement this program um, so that it relied on teachers to be the psychologists. And it was teachers who um, delivered to these two sessions of co cognitive behavior therapy to their high-risk youth. Um, we we're also interested in investigating the extent to which a targeted prevention program could have effects um, on the broader population. And so what our studies often look like is we go into schools and assess the entire year within a school, and it involves um, a lot of power, about 3,000 children initially screened. Um, in this study, schools were cluster randomized to either be trained and deliver these personality-targeted interventions or not. Um, High-risk children are identified, so it's about 45% of the population because we're identifying youth just based on statistical deviance, those who score one standard deviation on one of these four personality dimensions. And then they're followed every six months for two years. And um, what we've shown over a number of trials, this was a Canadian trial, this was the F efficacy trial, and this is now the effectiveness trial, is that we generally produce a 50% reduction in the likelihood of a young person taking up binge drinking. And there's very little evidence that there's a watering down of the effect when you begin to disseminate it to the community, when you start to train teachers to deliver the program. 
Um, these are results that were just published this month where we're also showing concurrent prevention of mental health problems. And so we're showing about 25 to 30% reduction in the onset of significant depression, um, anxiety problems, and conduct problems. Gee, Tommy, I'd be lost without your constant peer pressure, she says, holding his hand and smoking a cigarette. Um, I'll just un end up with this, this final finding, and that is how do the low-risk youth in intervention schools do by um, improving mental health in the high-risk students in that school? And these results were published last spring, where we show that, for the most part, these are high-risk youth who didn't receive intervention, high-risk youth who do receive an intervention. And what you see across most of the outcomes, so these are the more risky outcomes, frequency of binge drinking, quantity of drinking, and frequency and severity of alcohol-related problems, these problems are specific to the high-risk groups. And the interventions are effective in reducing these high-risk behaviors. And our low-risk kids are, are relatively protected by their low riskness. But if you look at a more low risk behavior, such as frequency of drinking, what you see is that, oops, punchline, what you see is that these are high risk youth in control schools, and these are high risk kids in intervention schools. These are low risk kids in control schools. And what happens by the end of the trial is they catch up to their high risk peers. So their drinking frequency is somehow influenced by high-risk peers. And what happens in the intervention schools is that the low-risk kids who didn't even receive an intervention were somehow protected by delivering interventions to the high-risk children. Um, so in public health, people call this a herd effect. What we find exciting about this is that I think what these results demonstrate is that there are both communicable parts to addiction and there are disease processes in addiction, and that intervention strategies need to target both. Um, and so now we're beginning to try to address um, how, what kind of strategies better capture this universal or this communicable part of the problem, and what strategies might be better at addressing the more vulnerable or the disease process in the problem. And I'm just going to um, wrap up then with a big thank you to CIHR, the European Commission, and a number of other funders for this work. Thank you.